Today, let's take the first step in learning about fire behavior. Hey, my name is Matt Hinkle, and this is gonna be part one in a series on fire behavior. Whether you're a brand new firefighter or a seasoned company officer, fire behavior or having an understanding of fire behavior can really help you. So if you're a beginner, maybe learning how to actually work the nozzle the way that you're supposed to, or if you're a seasoned company officer, it can help you make better fundamental fire ground decisions. So let's get right into it. This is going to be part one of Fire Behavior 101. What is fire? So this is kind of one of those topics that comes up where everybody just kind of blows it off like it's nothing, but it's really important to understand what is fire before you even get into fire behavior or fire tactics or understanding strategies or anything like that. We need to know what it is in the beginning. So just to keep it simple, fire is really just a chemical reaction. You see light and you feel heat from that reaction. Now, when we start talking about fire behavior, we really have to address one of the very first things, which is what are the states of matter and why, does, why is that even relevant for fire behavior? So it's very common for us to know states of matter are solid, liquid, and gas. We don't get into plasma typically for firefighters, but three main uh, states of matter that we deal with are solids, liquids, or gases. And you may be wondering, why is this important for fire behavior? Well, really it's because wood is a solid, gasoline is a liquid. They both burn, but they do not burn in the solid or the liquid state. They burn as a vapor. The vapor has to be produced or a gas has to be produced uh, for fire to occur. So let's use one of the most well-known examples of transferring states of matter or a product transferring from one state or transitioning from one state of matter to another. Easiest one to talk about is water. Uh, and you'll see why this is really important in just a second. So let's use water as an example because it's the easiest one to understand. If we freeze water, which is 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, then we're gonna have a solid and we know that is ice. As we bring the temperature of, of that material up, past 32 degrees, it starts to become a liquid. And then all the way from 32 degrees to 212 degrees, it stays in a liquid state. And at 212 degrees, we get vapor, water vapor, also called steam. So that is the boiling point of water and that produces water vapor. So let's transition that example over to a product like gasoline. Gasoline's flash point is negative 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And what that means is at negative 45 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a very low number, the product is producing enough vapor to basically flash. You'll also hear the term flame point or fire point. And the difference between flash point and flame point is very, very close. Flash point is literally the temperature at which the product can create a flash, but it can't sustain combustion. Flame point or fire point, depending on what book you're looking at, uh, is when the vapor is significant enough that the product can sustain combustion. Those are usually really close together. But basically, at negative 45, gasoline's already producing vapor that can ignite. So that's why gasoline is a little more volatile than other products, and volatility of a product is dependent on how much vapor does it produce at whatever temperature that you're at? So if it's a 100 degree day, uh, like in my state, if you're on asphalt and it's 97 degrees outside in the summer, gasoline is producing a major amount of vapor and it's very, very readily ignitable. So let's jump over to a solid fuel. So we know that a liquid has to turn into a vapor for it to burn, but what does a solid do? A solid basically does the same thing, but we call this pyrolysis. Pyrolysis is the thermal decomposition of a material. And basically what that means is wood won't readily burn. Wood has to break down in order to be able to burn. So this is why if you throw a log on a campfire, it doesn't just spontaneously combust. It, it's not, it has to start breaking down that wood um, to be able to burn. So if you dry the wood out or if you preheat the wood and raise the ignition temperature of the wood, it becomes more readily ignitable. If you chop the wood into fine pieces and allow more surface area for the wood to come in contact with a heat source, it will go into pyrolysis faster. So that's why we do that. Wood does not have a fixed ignition temperature, and that's because of humidity and density and all kinds of other things. So we just know a range that wood will burn in. And obviously, if you're in the western part of the United States, you have a much drier climate and you're, you're used to 
seeing these really large wildland fires. But if you go over to the southeastern portion of the United States, we have a more wet climate, a more humid climate, and it's harder for us to have fires like they have out west. So most books jump into fuel, or what are the types of fuel? And really, we're not going to get into that. We're just going to keep it real plain and simple. A fuel is a material that, that stores energy. So basically, fuel is potential energy. Fuels can be any number of things. They can be woods, papers, gasolines, doesn't matter. A, a fuel is not a liquid. A fuel is something that can burn or something that stores energy and is able to burn. So why does this matter? Well, basically because firefighters typically use predominantly water to absorb the energy of a material, but also to coat surfaces in water and reduce the product's ability to turn into a gas or a vapor or to go through pyrolysis. This is how we protect exposures. We talk about flowing water directly on the structure next to the one that's on fire because that will absorb heat energy. It will reflect the, the radiant heat somewhat. It's kind of an opaque type solution. It'll kind of reflect that heat, but it will also reduce the ability for the product, the surface, to start off gassing or to start producing a vapor or go through pyrolysis. So if you can inhibit pyrolysis or if you can prevent the product from turning into a vapor, it can't burn. It has a very difficult time getting to that point. If we have too much heat energy and not enough water, the energy outruns the water's ability to absorb it and it will still ignite. So let's jump into the fire triangle and the fire tetrahedron. Uh, a lot of your books will have both of those in there. Uh, and really the main reason they do is because the fire tetrahedron is fairly new in discussions. The fire triangle has been around for a long time, but it wasn't until later that really we decided as a community, the chemical reaction needs to be addressed. So let's do this really quick. The fire triangle basically says there are three elements that need to be present for a fire to be able to burn oxygen, heat, and fuel. So the way that we as firefighters can uh, fight fire is we can remove one of those elements. So if we take away oxygen, smother the fire, the fire will go out. Typical example of this is a grease fire on a stove and you take the lid of a pan and just close the lid and it has no ability to get air and the fire goes out. Fuel is another one. So firefighters can remove fuel, not typically by running outdoors with a couch that's on fire from inside the house, but one of the most common ways is either shutting a valve off to a liquid fuel source, uh, like refineries and things like that, or shutting off the power that could remove a fuel source, but also cutting down trees or digging fire breaks or doing back burns or anything like that in a wildland fire also can remove fuel. And that is a really common way that wildland firefighters uh, try to mitigate risk at a wildland fire is dealing with the fuel itself. And then we have heat, which is the vast majority of the way that the typical municipal structural firefighter fights fire, and that is applying water to remove the heat or to reduce the heat energy, and that also can make the fire go out. So what's the tetrahedron? It's basically exactly the same thing with one additional component added to it, and that's the chemical chain reaction. So basically, the reason the tetrahedron is there is because we do have to uh, recognize the fact that a chemical chain reaction has to take place for fire to continue to burn. And if you disrupt that chemical chain reaction, the fire will also go out. So that's absent from the fire triangle, but essentially they're the same thing. Uh, they're just kind of a more modern look at what elements have to be there for a fire to occur. Uh, it's just typically as an, as a, typical firefighter, you're not removing the chemical chain reaction or you're not specifically addressing that. You're doing something else and making the fire go out rather than actually addressing the chain reaction. So one of the best examples that I like to use is, is comparing a carburetor to the structure that's on fire. If you're not familiar with a carburetor, a carburetor mixes fuel and air uh, to achieve an efficient burn for an engine, for a, a combustion engine. Uh, so that is the combustion process. If you have too much fuel and not enough air, we call that too rich and it doesn't burn as efficient. This is what the choke does on an engine. When you choke the engine, you're increasing the fuel mixture, decreasing the air, and having a more rich uh, mixture inside of the carburetor. If you take the choke off or if you lean it out, when we get more lean, we're getting more air and less fuel, and somewhere in the balance, we're running the most efficient burn that we can. Now look at a structure fire. A structure fire is exactly the same thing. If you take the doors and windows and treat those as the air inlets and air outlets, then basically 
you having the ability to control the amount of air going in and out of a structure is the exact same thing as a carburetor controlling the amount of air going in and out of an engine. So even though sometimes that's out of our control, having the understanding of the concept of how air and fuel mix within a structure can make you be a much, much better firefighter and specifically a much better company officer. So let's carry on with that, that topic. And that is, let's use the example of a Bunsen burner. And right here we have some pictures uh, of a Bunsen burner flame. If you're not familiar with a Bunsen burner, it's what you see in labs. It's a natural gas, typically natural gas fed uh, little torch that heats up beakers and things like that in the lab. Most of us have used them in school or, or something similar. Um, but a, a Bunsen burner has the ability to adjust the amount of air going into the flame. So if you have a good, good, uh, or if you choke down the air, you're going to get number one. You're going to get a more orange flame, a less efficient burn, something that's lacking the amount of air. In our world now, we would call that ventilation limited. Uh, if we move over to the next flames, we're progressively getting a better balance of fuel and air. And on the very far right, you see number four, we're going to have the most efficient burn. If you've ever looked at natural gas burn and it's blue, you're going to notice there's no smoke. There, there's hardly any byproduct that's left over when natural gas burns. It's very, very clean. Whereas if we look at wood burning, we have stuff that's left over. And that is called the byproducts of combustion. It can also be smoke. Smoke is actually byproducts of the combustion process. It's basically saying the fire didn't burn well enough, so we have these smoke particles that go up in the air. And yes, smoke can be ignited because they're just particles that didn't finish burning. So the more efficient burn you have, the less smoke you have. The less efficient burn you have, the more smoke you have. And this is where kind of learning how to understand and read smoke uh, or the art of reading smoke, as a lot of people say, this is where that can become a really good thing to understand as an officer or, or a line level firefighter is basically what is the fire doing at the moment? What, what's the behavior? Is it need air? Does it have air? Um, is it fuel limited? Is it vent limited? That's all those things are very hard to kind of understand, but it takes experience and a background knowledge of all of this to really understand what's going on on the fire ground. So let's take a look at a couple of pictures that can help you kind of understand what's going on at the fire. In this first image, we have a fire that is very vent limited or most likely very vent limited. You're seeing very uh, dark, pressurized, turbulent smoke. And that's an indication that the fire is not burning efficiently. The fire is choked down and it's producing more byproducts of combustion because it's not able to burn very efficiently. So we're seeing these really thick plumes of smoke that are really charged and turbulent. If you pull up on the scene of this, you should recognize, you know, it could be products of combustion that change the smoke, of course, but it's most likely due to the fact that this is a ventilation limited type fire. Um, so the fire is warning air. And as you start opening things up, doors, windows, vent the roof, anything like that, you're going to get a significant growth of the fire because that's what it needs. So let's look at another one. This is another ventilation limited type fire. This is a heavy charged, turbulent smoke. Firefighters are at the door to make entry. They have a line in place. Uh, it, you know, you can see some free burning fire over there on the right. That's probably a carport or a garage. Um, but basically this is showing that there is a lack of air moving in and out of that structure. Now you're going to see this really commonly in our modern structures because of the way that we insulate our homes. We have double pane windows and good insulation and tight doors and you know, the, everything's insulated really well. So the, the structure does not breathe as well, which means you get a less, less efficient burn, even though we have really, really efficient or not efficient, but really volatile products inside. And we'll get into that a little bit later on. So let's carry that theme to the next photo. In this picture, we see the, the smoke conditions are very, very different. And what do you notice different from this photo to the one before? Well, basically you're seeing ventilation points. You're seeing fire that's vented through outlets, through windows. Uh, and that is providing an air pathway or a flow path for air to run through the structure and it's ventilated. So the fire's burning more efficiently. It will increase heat release rates Fire will grow faster with more air, but at the same time, that's a big balancing game tactically on do you want to control the vent points 
or uncontrol, uncontrolled vent points. Those can be really, really bad or uncontrolled flow paths can be really, really dangerous. But you notice that this, these smoke conditions are much more lean. There's not as much turbulence. The color's not as dark. There's not as much volume of smoke. All of that stuff is diminished because it's good ventilation. The fire is ventilated very well and the fire is burning more efficiently. So let's jump to this picture. This picture is showing some firefighters that just cut a vent hole in a roof of, of a structure. So you'll see in this picture, there's hardly any smoke. Uh, and this is for multiple reasons, but one of the biggest is they've cut a vent hole in the roof and they're providing an efficient burn. They have provided a flow path or ventilation point for the air to leave the structure. And this is one, allowing smoke to exit the structure through the through the roof vertically, but it's also providing a flow path or air movement from the bottom of the structure towards the top, and it's creating a more efficient burn. So you're getting less smoke production, and the fire has a pathway to travel. Um, I, this can increase the growth of a fire, absolutely, but it can also be very strategic if done right uh, to control the pathway or the growth of the fire. So I know that was quick. That was just the foundation. This is going to be a multi-part series. If you want to keep watching the series of videos, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel and you can follow us at our website or Facebook page, Box Alarm Training. I'll put all the links up uh, and, and the future links to the videos will be in the description below. So thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.